Hi folks, Brian here. Welcome to another episode of Harmonic Leadership. And um, obviously I've had my cataract surgery, had it this morning. I uh, assume everything went well. It's feeling, feeling as it should, as they expected it to. So I get to take the patch off in a couple of hours, but I thought it would be interesting to make this video with the uh, patch on. So after going through the surgery, after they uh, actually went in to break up the cataract with the laser, um, and then I was able to only see just light and some very, um, uh, very broad shape through that left eye. So as I was sitting there waiting to go in to get the to the surgery room to get the uh, cataract or the new lens actually put in, uh, I was I was closing my right eye, so I was only seeing out through my left eye, and. Um, uh, and experiencing what people who are primarily blind experience, uh, where they can only see some some faint lights and very faint um, shapes, uh, where there are people or or things uh, that uh, that people with sight uh, find easy to see, uh, and it really brought an interesting perspective. Uh, and then with the patch on, it's been very interesting because depth perception is gone. So that perspective is different as well. Um, and um, it, it got me thinking about the word perspective. Uh, since we all approach life and approach our leadership with different perspectives. So I did a search in harmonic leadership and found that I use the word perspective uh, 68 times. Um, and I was looking for a specific reference that is called perspective taking and I have to put these on to be able to see the iPad. So page 129, if you have the print version of the book, uh, page 129 we talk about perspective taking. There's um, a psychological concept or construct called the theory of mind and that is being able to get out of one's own thoughts and take the perspective, perspective taking, take the perspective of the other person or the other people who you are working with and or leading. And it's such an important concept in leadership that too many leaders just don't think of. Um, if I'm leading someone, I'm going to be approaching the situation in my natural way they're going to be approaching the situation in their natural way and these two ways could be completely different and possibly incongruent. We could be going in the opposite directions. Uh, on the previous page, on page 128 in the book, um, I speak about the center point of care and this shows up in a couple of sections. Um, in the book and the center point of care concept is is one of the primary concepts within harmonic leadership uh, if you've um, if you bought the book yet or explored any of the content online you know that I have my harmonic leadership styles wheel with the six types the center point of care is that point in the middle where all of those various triangles meet and the concept is very simple it's it's uh, just saying that uh, I as an observer type primarily uh, if I can step to the center of the harmonic leadership styles wheel, to the center point of care, it allows me to use that perspective taking concept to say, okay, how would, let's say an encourager or an engager or any of the other types, how would they be approaching this situation? What is going to be their perspective of what's going on and how things should be? Uh, handled and how things should proceed. And that greatly, greatly helps in uh, a person's leadership to be able to to take that perspective. Use that theory of mind where you're getting out of your own mind. It's if, as if you're getting into their mind to see how they would be thinking, approaching a given situation. So I invite you to explore that concept, uh, to uh, look at those couple of pages in the book. Taking another perspective or considering our perspective and how others perspectives could be the same could be different uh, can be a very valuable tool within your leadership take care you probably see some strange marks and strange um, features in my eye I'll lean in so you can see the uh, grossness of it <laughs>
So I did have my eye surgery a couple of days ago. I had a episode where I talked about it a little bit, and so I'm just providing a follow-up to that and wrapping up uh, some of the themes that we had talked about in that uh, previous episode. Um, it's been a very interesting experience. Uh, I assume it's healing well. I had my follow-up appointment yesterday, and the doctor said it's doing fine. Uh, Lori, my wife, who's an ophthalmic, uh, certified ophthalmic technician and surgery nurse, um, says that it's doing fine as well, especially in comparison to all the others that uh, she works with week after week. Um, so I guess it's doing good. It's still a little bit fuzzy. I'm supposed to have good distance vision once it fully heals, but due to the hematoma and uh, due to um, the, the, the cuts that they actually make on the surface of the eye to help with the astigmatism, <coughs> it will be a, a few more days uh, before I have a, a good feel on how the finalized vision will be. But the interesting thing has been the brilliance. Uh, I picked up the Harmonic Leadership book yesterday because I was mailing a copy to a potential client, and I opened it up, and it's like, oh, this is very bright and brilliant. Uh, and frankly, when I got the first printing back, I thought, oh, it's faded. It doesn't look very good. Uh, the, the grayscale version doesn't look very good on paper. Um, it was the eyes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was kind of shocking yesterday to open it up and go, oh, huh. <laughs> I, can, I can see the, uh, the variation in the, in the grayscale, and the text looks much darker. And uh, that graphic that I thought was too faded, it's, oh, yeah, I can, I can uh, read the words on top of that lighter graphic. Uh, in the book, I do have a number of graphics that you end up uh, potentially writing on, so I intentionally kept those fairly light uh, so you could have pen mark over it and be able to read. And when I got the printer version back, I thought, oh, it's too light or, or, or not brilliant enough or not, uh, not uh, rich enough. Um, but they are. So hopefully you're finding that too. If it doesn't seem like it to you, have your eyes checked. You may have cataracts. <laughs> as I did. So you can see uh, Lily the puppy uh, over my uh, left shoulder out there enjoying some sunlight this morning. And you know a lot of the work that I do is is in that realm of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, in the book, in the uh, first chapter, there's a decent amount of, of information about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And when I was going through the surgery, um, I found it very interesting because I went through two stations. First was the laser where they go in and actually cut up, cut up, um, um, jumble up the cataract itself and they make the incisions that they'll take out the old cataract pieces and fixes the astigmatism on the surface of the eye. Um, and then you go into the surgery room where they actually suck out all of those chunks of the cataract that the laser had, had torn apart. Uh, and then put the new lens, the synthetic lens, in through that incision. Uh, but between those two stations, you have about 10 minutes or so. And during those 10 minutes, um, after they had busted up the old um, biological lens that had the cataract on it, um, I couldn't really see anything out of that eye at all. Uh, I could only see light. And... Um, when I was um, laying back in the bed waiting to be wheeled into the surgery center, I just intentionally closed my right eye so I could look up at the light source. I knew that there were some fluorescents on the ceiling. And just to experience for those few minutes what it would be like to be legally blind. Um, my wife was along with me for the entire process, even though she wasn't working in the surgery center that day. She, they let her go ahead and scrub in and, and follow me through the process. So I was asking her about it. I said, so is this what legally blind people experience? And she said, yes, there's, you know, two forms of blindness. One is, is darkness where, um, you, um, cannot see anything. The other is light sensitive, uh, blindness where all you can see is, is lights and possibly some shapes. And she's leaning over telling me that, and I could see a rough image or outline or shape of where she was, um, between the light source and my eye. Uh, and it was just, it was, it was fascinating, first of all, to experience it, and I consider it a gift to have those 
those uh, limited few minutes to experience what those who do fall into the category of blindness experience. Uh, and again, it just tells me that they are heroes to be able to navigate this world that has not been designed for them. Um, this industrial age to now technolo technological aged world is definitely not designed for those who are sight impaired, but they have found a way to adapt and to adopt practices to be able to function. Uh, they are truly heroes for doing this. Um, and, you know, throughout the world there are various protections. Here in the States uh, we have uh, protections that, for those who have disabilities uh, that, that came from the 1990 American with Disabilities Act. Um, but there's still, even though there's some legal requirements to accommodate, um, there, there's still so much out there that is not um, friendly to those with disabilities. And, um, you know, we have our standard uh, protections of diversity uh, through the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Uh, Title VII within that um, provided protections in the areas of uh, race, uh, sex, um, color, uh, national origin. And then we've had other laws, including American Disabilities with the Act, uh, Lilly Ledbetter Gender Equality Act, for gender pay equality and other acts and uh, s supplemental um, um, legislation and some legal decisions that have created a number of protections that uh, we in the business world now need to to follow um, to remain compliant. Uh, but there's compliance and then there's the right thing to do. And unfortunately a lot of people stop at the compliance measures and they don't take it further what is the absolute right thing to do to not only accommodate but celebrate these differences in abilities uh, we all have different abilities um, and and some of them are, are physical uh, I technically am in a um, disabled class due to a number of things I won't go into now I may have an episode at some point about all my various uh, disabilities, um, but technically I'm I'm disabled, um, so I am in a protected class. I'm also in the age protected class, being 58 at this point as well. <clears throat> uh, but I have faced a number of of uh, discriminatory acts and a lot of bias in my career as I started getting older. I hit I hit 50, and it's like oh something changed. Something definitely changed. And um, when my disabilities uh, started affecting the way that I could do the work, something changed. And I, I, I had the looks. I, I saw those micro-communications that were micro-inequities. Um, and, and, and it was very interesting um, to, to see the effect. And yes, I'm a Caucasian male. So I've never faced race discrimination, uh, as so many sadly, unfortunately, have. Uh, my wife is Hispanic descent, so I've seen it through her and how people, some people, um, 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 deal with her differently. Um, she gets stopped at the airport a whole lot to get uh, to get uh, checked at the security gate, where I rarely do. Uh, my son, who is darker, also gets stopped a lot more than I do. Um, so, yeah, there, there's definitely inequities out there. Uh, they are real, and those who say that they are not um, are blinding themselves to the realities of, of what we face within the society. Um, and it's, it's definitely worse in some parts of the country than others, but it is pervasive. And we need to, we need to admit that and acknowledge it. Um, even walking around yesterday, uh, we went to the store yesterday evening with this big blobby red part of my eye, people are looking at me funny. It's like, what's wrong with you? Um, and not, not with concern, but with judgments. Like, <laughs> why? Uh, why people? Why are we going around judging each other uh, based on our physical attributes? Um, but we face that throughout our lives. Uh, it starts in school where there's so much judgment and so many cliques that are formed solely through physical ability, uh, physical looks, attractiveness. Um, and that starts us down this awkward path that continues into adulthood, continues into the workplace. So we need to go beyond the laws in order to create uh, positive, fully inclusive environments where difference is celebrated.
So I invite you to explore that section of the book. Uh, good, good, healthy section in there about diversity, equity, and inclusion in that uh, first chapter of the book, establishing baselines. And because uh, this is a baseline to leading through inclusive, mindful caring, that inclusive part is absolutely critical. And that's why I put it first before mindful caring. Caring is the overall theme of the book, leading with caring. Uh, but uh, that can only be done if we are fully being inclusive to all people of difference. So I wish you the best. Be well, everyone. Hi folks, Brian here. Just continuing this little series on my eye surgeries. So I had my right eye operated on today, two weeks after my left eye, and uh, the surgery was just a few hours ago. Uh, they say it went well, so in a couple of days I guess we shall see if I can see better than I could see before. So we'll see. Um, it's uh, it's incredible, you know, as I reflected today and tying this into to leadership and harmonic leadership, as I reflected today um, about the, the medical advancements and, and any sort of advancements that we have in any field can only come through leadership, through somebody taking steps, uh, through somebody um, uh, doing that divergent thinking, getting outside the box and thinking um, thinking what can come to be and how can we make this next level uh, attainable um, and and it takes that kind of leader to create the positive change in the world um, it wasn't that long ago you know I think it's 150 or so years ago if I remember right before that uh, if you had cataracts uh, you would basically go blind and I was getting fast on that road uh, the left eye had progressed so much in the past few months that uh, it probably by the end of the year it would have been um, I'm not sure if it would be legally or technically blind at that point but definitely the point where I wouldn't be able to function and the right eye um, was going to start that path fairly soon according to my wife uh, who's a, a certified ophthalmic technician and the doctors sorry trash day so we have trash trucks going around we have lawn crews so a little noisy out here apologies for that um, but I, I was on the path to be fairly um, uh, fairly uh, lacking in vision within within a year or so and I'm only 58 so that um, and most of my work is obviously done on computer um, and a lot of reading a lot of writing um, and and video work and audio work and media work, uh, so it would have gotten to the point where I would have had to greatly adapt. Um, and uh, you know, as we talked about in the previous sections of this piece, uh, some people have had to adapt. Uh, some people who are uh, disabled, uh, lacking vision, and there are adaptive technologies, um, and they are truly heroes in being able to function at the high levels that they do. But for somebody like me who hasn't had that issue and would then have to learn how to adapt at such a late age, uh, yeah, it would have been difficult. Uh, so I'm extremely grateful for the medical breakthroughs. And, you know, regardless of what we do in our work, we can find ways to do things better. Um, you know, there, there's two, two forms of, 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 of thought. There's convergent thinking, there's divergent thinking. Convergent thinking is, I, I like to call it inside-the-box thinking. It's, it's, it's closed, it's pointing in one direction. Uh, there's, there's going to be one conclusion that comes from that. And typically it's within the parameters of, of normal accepted thought within our culture, within our environment. Um, things that have been done before, we're going to choose to do those things again because either we, we made them work before or somebody else made them work, we read about them. Uh, it, it's proven, um, but to get the advancements to create things like cataract surgeries, we have to do divergent thinking. We have to get outside the box. We have to think, okay, what if? Um, and that and that what if thinking is what can, first of all, ask the questions that need to be asked to say, to say, what if we did this differently? What if we could correct this this problem with people's vision? 
uh, and then and then let's come up with these creative ideas on on possibilities and and get really wide open in the ideas and uh, only when you have those wide ideas out on the, the the table or the board or however you're collecting them or in the mind um, then you can put some reality testing towards it and start down a more convergent path and we can do this in our own thoughts with our own ideas and as a team as a group so when you're going through any sort of uh, ideation session with your teams uh, start in that divergent view that outside the box it's wide open thinking uh, in the harmonic leadership book you find some um, you find some techniques on how to do this and so I invite you to uh, read those um, and, um, and and a path for for creating uh, I ideas as a group starting out in divergent thinking doing reality testing finally getting to the point where you're converging on on the the reality based options of the day but keeping those those wild crazy divergent thoughts um, uh, on on the t on the table for later because uh, things change parameters change technologies change advancements are made that might allow us and budget perhaps or, or resources human or otherwise uh, could change where we could pull those those crazy wild divergent thoughts back on to uh, a convergent path maybe sometime in the future that uh, can pass that reality test so we can advance even more all right. Well, I'm, I'm, I know I'm rambling today. Apologies for that, but I um, wanted to just get some thoughts down. And uh, just to uh, say again, I'm so grateful that somebody along the way did this divergent thinking, saying, "Hey, we can correct these these cataracts that are growing. We we can put in uh, a lens that will allow people to see again." So I look forward to seeing you uh, more clearly as we uh, progress in our series. All right. Be well, everyone. Take care. Hi, folks. Brian here. So I'm going to uh, try to wrap up this little, uh, what has become a mini-series on my eye surgeries, and I'll try to wrap it up as succinctly as I possibly can. Um, it's now been one month since the eye surgery on my left eye, two weeks since uh, the eye surgery on my right eye. And I can say that, uh, you know, over the last few days, the last uh, five to six days, the healing has really progressed, and I can now tell what it's going to be like. And it's going to be amazing, like like crazy good. Uh, I'm still using these these cheaters for uh, uh, reading glasses, for screens and for text, uh, which I'll always need to have some support for uh, close vision. But when I take the glasses off, anything over six to seven feet is in focus, uh, like amazingly in focus. And the clarity, the the textures I can see are better than I've seen in years. It's like going back 18 years in my life to when I was 40 and my vision first started failing a little bit. Um, I'd come out in the mornings and do my qigong exercises in the rock garden, and when I do, I look up at the at the stars and the moon if it's in phase. And I've been shocked at the amount of clarity I'm seeing now. Uh, instead of um, instead of uh, double points of light due to my double vision and there being fuzziness and and kind of a cloud effect i'm now seeing a single point of light and not just on the close planets and brighter stars even on those distant stars those fainter stars uh, that i haven't seen in years i'm now seeing them um, and and it's in a single point of light so it's just uh, crazy good so it makes me really appreciate uh, the the scientific uh, breakthroughs that have occurred um, and in tying uh, tying up the series, you know, we've talked about the disability aspects. We've talked about how that ties into diversity and inclusion. We've talked about perspective taking um, uh, through the theory of mind, putting ourselves into the mind of others so we can understand how they're approaching situations. Um, and I think to wrap it up, I'm just going to share some gratefulness and appreciation for the scientific breakthroughs. Uh, we spend a little bit of time talking about uh, ideation and thinking outside the box, that divergent thinking to come up with these advancements. And did a little uh, research, you have to put the readers back on for this as I pull up my iPad. So did a little bit of research on the history of cataract surgery and I thought it was fairly recent, but uh, they've actually been doing a form of cataract surgery for 4,000 years. The ancient Egyptians, um, 
found a way to, to use an instrument to actually poke into the eye, push the cataract lens back in the eye to restore some amount of vision. Crazy. Uh, but the, uh, the modern methods did not come to be until the mid-1900s when they started playing around with various ways to actually extract the, uh, the, uh, the, the lens. I, I, I should say in 1748, uh, there was a French ophthalmologist who found a way to pull out the lens, but it sounds kind of barbaric. <laughs> it was the mid-1900s that they started to figure out ways to do it more effectively. Uh, and then uh, it was not until 1978, 44 years ago, that they actually did the first lens implant which is basically the technique that they still use today. So it's only been 44 years. Before that, uh, if I had been um, going through this you know, 45 years ago and before, I would have just eventually gone to the point of blindness um, where I would not be able to, to have any vision um, uh, except for light sensitivity. Um, the uh, 1986 is when they introduced lasers into the process to create what is now the more the more common way to uh, to do this of using lasers to make the incisions and to fix the astigmatism. So just gratefulness that um, there have been people through the years, leaders through the years, who have come up with ways to um, make these advancements to get us to the point where we're at today, to where now it's you know as it was explained to me 99 plus percent effective, um, where you're going to have really, really good results. And it's starting to look like my results are going to be better than expected, which is amazing. Okay, so uh, thank you for joining me on this journey. Sorry, it's probably been very long videos. I've been rambling quite a bit just because it's been quite the experience. But hopefully if you are going through this experience now or will in the future, Hopefully this uh, series of, of clips will provide you some level of comfort in the process of understanding and you know through knowledge comes power. So you can, you can approach your situation hopefully with more confidence and more comfort. So with that, I will wish you as I always try to do to, uh, uh, to be well. Take care everyone. Bye-bye.